Good morning. Thank you very much for being here for a round table that takes place under the auspices of two lively dynamic hubs of research and pedagogy at UCLA, the CMRS SEGS, whose new director, Professor Zinka Stauliak, has reoriented toward the thematic, interconnected, highly relevant modus operandi, and the program in experimental critical theory, ECT, which I have the honor and the pleasure of co-directing with Zrinka. Zrinka will welcome all of us on behalf of CMRS, SACS, and ACT. But let me say a few words to introduce this round table by situating this question, neoclassical or neoclassics, question mark, in the context of the ECT seminars of which it is the culminating event. To start, let me say that we acknowledge the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovanga, Los Angeles Basin, South Channel Islands. As a land grant institution, we pay our respect to the Onugvetam ancestors, Ahi Hiram elders, and Eyo Heimken, our relatives, relations, past, present, and emerging. Let me also thank the deans of the humanities and the social sciences and our generous donor for their trust and their ongoing support. While taking up the challenge of co-directing the program after its direction by our colleagues in comparative literature, Kenneth Reinhardt, Professor Stahuliak and I have decided to start with a particular kind of thinking, namely comparative thinking. We have done so because the interest for reassessments, redefinitions, and reorientations of comparative methods in disparate fields of knowledge, from literature to history, from anthropology to political theory, is one of the timely questions of the day. Why? Why is this good to think about? Well, comparison can be understood as a predictable quest for analogies and similarities to be discovered between phenomena that we consider at the outset as already comparable on account of cultural diffusion, historical tradition, or geographical contiguity. But this is not what we have intended to do in our seminars. We take the disposition to think in comparison and by comparison as a fundamental way of looking at the world through provocative contrast, experimental connections, and unexpected fluidities. These perspectives are especially thought-provoking for those who study the ancient societies of Greece and Rome and the Greek or Roman multicultural empire. This is why we are concluding the ECT seminars of 2022 with this particular round table. We want to focus on a vast and multifarious domain of knowledge that has been repeatedly challenged by comparatism. The tradition of Indo-European studies, the Cambridge School and individual scholars such as Geoffrey Lloyd and Hano Gagné here with us, the so-called Paris School, the research centers of comparative literature in Paris and Lausanne, for instance, and the group of the journal Asdival. When the scholars concerned with these ancient societies, Greece and Rome, well, they have been tempted, inspired, and contaminated by comparative linguistics, comparative literature, the comparative study of religions, and the quintessentially comparative social science, anthropology be it James George Fraser, Georges Dumézil, or Claude Lévi-Strauss, well, when uh, scholars of ancient societies have been inspired, tempted, contaminated by comparatism, they have taken up the challenge of thinking in comparison and by comparison. And this has always been innovative, a, so a sort of antidote. An antidote to what? not to philology, but to the postulate of incomparability. On the one hand, these cultures, still called classical, seem to be so self-reliant in their complexity, so historically ubiquitous, inspiring, and paradigmatic, so obviously great, that we might be tempted to consider them purely and simply unique. 
On the other hand, over the centuries, the intellectual, textual, and material artifacts of these same cultures, from grammar to sculpture to philosophy, have been studied, imitated, translated, commented upon, thought and rethought, admired, vilified, re-elaborated in myriad fashions in so many different circumstances that we should rather realize how available they are to open-ended metamorphosis. The cultural creativity of those peoples generates two different receptions, idealization, identification on the one hand, and but a potentially inexhaustible plastic, delocalized, impertinent, subjective, stratified, critical curiosity. Neoclassical versus infinitely new classics. To accept the possibility of comparison, including situations of diachronic and local receptions, is to accept the admiration without the identification, the grandness without the uniqueness, the passion without the fetish, the scholarly engagement without pious devotion. And this is not a matter of solipsistic reinvention for soul-searching academics. It makes easier for us and for our students to understand the horror stories of slave societies, sexist societies, militaristic, rude, violent, ethnocentric culture, because this is how these people thought and behave too. It makes it easier to appreciate both the omnipresent, undeniable impact of the Greek or Roman tradition on so many different moments in the cultural history of the world without falling back on default platitudes about origins, heritage, identity, and other embarrassing miracles. Deference crumbles. Ideological, self-serving, exclusionary, racist appropriations emerge as equally undeniable aspect of a messy political history. Comparison is a disenchanted, dynamic way of taking up the challenge of decolonizing classics. It is quintessentially uh, experimental, critical thinking. But what kind of comparative thinking can help us really to deflate the neoclassical? Anthropology. Anthropology is the study of human beings living in societies and creating symbolic systems that we call cultures. It changes the way classical scholars study the ancient world. Why? Well, because first of all, it treats Greek and Roman societies as precisely societies cultures as precisely cultures. This makes a difference in the epistemic mood. It distracts from privileging collections of texts, treasures of precious objects, historical moments, political paradigms, philosophical and scientific beginnings, or more or less remote origins, again, of our own world. Through the study of any possible form of creativity, anthropology aims at understanding societies and cultures in their own contextualized terms. Let me sketch three premises. The first premise is that societies are indeed complex. They are made up of very concrete practices. We know that producing, trading, governing, eating, fighting, killing, marrying, singing, playing, dancing, and of active social relations such as kinship, politics, exchange, reciprocity, power, exploitation, slavery, friendship, sexuality, war, education, religion. These phenomena are experiences imbued with meaning for the people who live them. They embody values, norms, aspirations, let us say ideas, which make sense for those people. The second premise is that these two levels, the concrete and the ideological, should be understood always together. Anthropology places a deliberate focus on the interconnections of economies, institutions, laws, rituals, morals, languages, mythologies, fictional representations, and performances in all media and all possible forms of normative knowledge, from philosophy to medicine. Social representations take the most different forms from a law to a poem. The scholar who studies poetry should not forget the law and vice versa. 
The third premise is that ideas themselves circulate, analogies, metaphors, models, and on the contrary, oppositions and contrasts for constellations. Actual forms of life can be understood together with the norms that inspire them. The anthropologist is prepared to make sense of this interconnectedness, to look for non-casual associations, to reconstruct a logic of the concrete, Lévi-Strauss, and to shed light upon lines of thoughts which run across the most disparate cultural phenomena. Transdisciplinarity is truly the core of an anthropolog anthropological approach. Rather than a theory, this is a method, and it is compatible with the most authoritative manners of studying the ancient world, archaeology, epigraphy, philology, intertextuality, um, and the multiple versions of history, you name it, offer indispensable tools to an outlook that privileges, once again, cultural complexity. But the competitive advantage of anthropology resides in the synergy of the multiple form of technical expertise that might be relevant to a given object of study. A canonical author will not be studied as a towering individual. A great book will not be interpreted in its splendid isolation. Intertext will not be reduced to quell and forshung. Specific questions will not be examined for the sake of themselves. And this not out of indifference to deep knowledge, quite the opposite. Anthropology requires both specialized expertise and the ability to build bridges. By situating all artifacts, including texts, in their context against the background of shared knowledge, anthropology refreshes the interpretations of authorial strategies and argumentative intricacies. By drawing attention to the circulation of semantic habits, social representations, and discourses, it privileges language both as a vehicle and as a paradigm. While respecting the specificity of disparate intellectual milieu, it explores their permeability. Most important anthropology, a social science that was born comparative, encourages us to place the cultural configurations of Greece and Rome in comparison with those of others in the ancient world and beyond. The concrete practices, the social relations, and the need to think them are common to all societies. There is only one Plato, but everywhere people eat, marry, fight, and make worlds in which they can live together. And Plato, by the way, was very keen on understanding and even theorizing precisely these mundane concerns that make the life of a society, as Lévi-Strauss called the common object of history and anthropology. More to the point, taking stock of this commonality and systematically thinking by comparison can enlighten the specialist. Firstly, by observing, questioning the accomplishments of the Greeks and the Romans in contrast with what other people do, one can see better. Secondly, by engaging in the process of comparing, one immunizes oneself against the postulate of preeminence and the confirmation bias that so easily goes with it. Anthropology promotes a non anthropocentric understanding of the ancient world. It provides students and scholars with an antidote to the cult of the classical past. For all these reasons, anthropology has greatly contributed to the renewal of history in the last century. In the French intellectual milieu, the practice of comparing was collaborative and collective. A workshop setting was essential to the enterprise. It would bring to fruition research projects on a given topic, the very definition articulation of which would emerge in the course of those comparative exchanges. The very question to ask about that object, the progressively defined and articulated intentional objects, say war, sacrifice, the gods, land, divination, political practices were generated in a process of crowd thinking, so to speak, among specialists of different societies talking to each other, thinking together, redefining their words and their objects together, sharing questions even more than answers. And all of the above in a dialogical, collaborative, collegial situation, a sort of metalinguistic lab. 
Marcel Detienne, a Hellenist who has founded the Centre de Recherche Comparée sur les Sociétés Anciennes in 1964, together with Jean-Pierre Vernon, and who has been a leading anthropologist of ancient societies, has theorized more clearly than anyone else this experimental, again, style of work, which consists of constructing comparable, which means defining precise questions, objects, issues to be compared. Comparison is good when it is analytical, even granular, corpuscular, because this is how it replaces the holistic humanism, the sacrosanct monument, the venerable author, the great book, with lived experiences, discursive practices, circulating ideas, shared representations, narrative traditions, ritual habits, which were important for certain people in their own societies and cultures. Now these experiences lived there and then at a distance well have been revisited elsewhere, including here, which brings me back to the other kind of comparison which is desirable, a cultural comparative history, mindful of contemporary challenges and of the sedimentation of the past. In my own way, this is what I've tried to do, especially in my latest books. And this resonates actually with the programmatic description of the Department of Classics at Johns Hopkins University that I had the opportunity of chairing for many years. For an anthropology along with the Greeks, for a dialogical history, these were the two intents that Marcel de Tienne and I placed at the forefront of the curriculum. But we are here to look forward to innovative, responsible, diverse project. You do not need to compare to be a timely scholar. You don't even need to compare to be a comparatist in Pectore. You can be so many scholars at the same time. Thank you. <laughs>